Hello, wicked listeners. As usual, I'm Jan Bins, the person behind this one-man show, and you are listening to Wicked Crimes of Africa, episode 13, The Unsolved Murder of Annika Smith, part 1. As is our new norm, we'll start off with our segment called Missing SA. This episode's Missing SA is brought to you by NJ Hawkeby from A Crime Most Queer, a fellow South African-based podcast focusing on crimes involving the LGBTQ plus community. Take it away, NJ. Hey, Wicked listeners. For those who don't know me, I'm NJ Hawkeby, host of A Crime Most Queer. On my podcast, I focus on crimes involving the LGBTQ community, which is why I've been asked to present this edition of Missing SA. Today's case involves a member of the queer community, Wayne Smith, sometimes referred to by some media outlets as Wayne Johnson, which was Wayne's surname before he got married. Wayne was 42 at the time of his disappearance and was last seen leaving his office driving his grey Renault Clio with registration number HJ07RGGP at around 12 midday on June the 12th, 2019, to run some errands, presumably at or around Rosebank Mall. Wayne has brown hair and brown eyes, stands roughly 1.8 meters tall, and weighs approximately 70 kilograms. He has two tattoos, one on the left side of his chest that looks like a circle surrounded by a pattern, and another on his arm that looks like a heartbeat monitor pulse. According to his husband, he was wearing blue jeans and a white collared shirt, black bomber jacket, and Feli's shoes with red soles. Wayne's car would later be spotted in Tembisa on Gauteng's East Rand and would briefly appear on Facebook Marketplace for sale, but the post was taken down before any information could be gathered, and the car hasn't been seen since. Wayne's phone was last pinged around 9pm on the day of his disappearance in Robbie Ridge, Midrand, and a man in Kempton Park was subsequently found to be using Wayne's phone and SIM card, and he even tried to pretend to be Wayne for a time. He would ultimately hand himself into the police upon finding out that they were looking for him, where he was arrested for suspected kidnapping and hijacking. He was later released, pending an application to access the mobile device that had been found in his possession. Unfortunately, no further information is available at this time. If you have any information on what may have happened to Wayne or perhaps know his current whereabouts, please contact the Pink Ladies on 072-214-7439. You can also check out the Wicked Crime South Africa Facebook group for the missing persons poster and all of this information. Thanks, NJ. Now, before we begin, today's episode is sponsored by Snapshot Dragonfly Photography. Based in Seneville, Pretoria, Snapshot Dragonfly is there for any photography needs you have. But don't just take my word for it. Go have a look on the Facebook group. I shared the photos from my husband and my Valentine shoot there. And let me tell you, that was so much of a hoot. You can contact them through their Facebook page, or you can contact Ilse Root directly on 082-871-1967. And a special thank you to Snapshot Dragonfly Photography for the sponsor. There is one more thing. I am happy to announce I have taken the leap of faith. I have resigned from work and will now focus all my time not only on my podcast, but also on new projects. I am starting a podcast network. This will be a group of podcasts working together to help each other grow and improve. And on top of that, I am working on another very exciting project with some other podcasters but we will release more information on that at a later stage. Now, without any further interruptions, let's get into the case of Annika Smith. Hi there, listener. This is the disclaimer. Please note that Wicked Crime South Africa may contain graphic descriptions of violence, sexual assault or even death. Some episodes may also contain strong language. The content of this podcast may be harmful and unsuitable for some people. If any of this may bother you, please reconsider accessing our content. 
In the show notes, you will find the number for the trauma and counseling helpline, should you need it. I'm adding an extra disclaimer here to warn you that this case is not only gruesome, but also unsolved. If you are connected or related to the case in any way, I warn you now that you may not enjoy what I have to say. I will stick to the facts and keep my personal theories to myself. There are places where I will be adding my personal opinion, which I will point out as my personal opinion and should not be seen as fact. My research is almost entirely based on media articles. And as we have discovered before, There are facts that can be misinterpreted through media articles. Also know that the people of interest in this case is under order from the court to no longer talk to the media. And unfortunately, I fall under the media. I've also kept a record of all articles from where I received my information and will be happy to share the nearly 100 links to anyone that requests them. And lastly... This case, although 12 years old, is currently ongoing. I will explain this later on in the episode. So this episode is only the story as we know it, so far. Let's begin. On the 18th of July, 1993, Charlotte and Johan would welcome their beautiful blonde girl into the world. They would name her Annika. Annika has two maternal half-sisters. But on her father's side, she's the only child. She would attend the primary school of Teresa Park. And, as fate would have it be, and that same school would be Jan Rick, only three years younger than Annika, and a year her senior would be his sister. And yes, he assumed correctly, little Jan Rick would grow up to become the person you are currently listening to. Now, why am I telling you this useless information? Well, that would be because Annika was the case that started it all for me. Annika is not just a story for me to tell. She is a face that I remember. She walked the same hallways as I did. She got taught by the same teachers that taught me. She traveled down the same roads that I did. And I sincerely hope that through this episode, that I at least bring awareness to her case. And in a perfect world, somebody, somewhere, will listen to this episode, will listen to the story of Annika Smith, and they would remember something. They would remember a small detail, or remember a lie that was told to them, or the good would get the better of them, and this person will contact the police and help to bring this case to an end, to bring closure to her family and friends but still to this day wonder what happened to her. As a child, Annika would draw and paint with her mother. In primary school, she was part of the drummings, and for all of this, her mother was always involved, even making clothes for the school. In fact, her mother was so involved that even though it has been nearly 20 years since she had lost my sister, she still remembers her. I had contacted Charlotte when I decided it was time for me to cover the case. She unfortunately could not give me any information, but she did ask to see a photo of my sister. I showed her a photo, both recent and from around the time she would have known her, and she immediately recognized her, even remembering how long my sister had been with Annika and the Drummies. This simply shows you how involved Charlotte was in her daughter's life and how over the years she has not allowed any detail to slip her mind that may help her remember or recognize whomever did this to Annika. When Annika was aged 13, her parents would divorce. Annika would still go on to graduate from Teresa Park Primary and move on to Harrod Moritz High School. Here she would attend until the end of her grade 10 year in 2008, before relocating to Oudsuren in the Western Cape, roughly 1,200 kilometers away. Here, she would study tourism at the South Cape College for nine months, before asking to move back to Pretoria to stay with her father that had been diagnosed with cancer, and 
due to the fact that she and her new stepfather did not get along too well. Annika's stepfather was very strict, and Annika had a very free spirit. Her mother, feeling trapped in the middle between her daughter and her husband, finally agreed, and Annika made her way back to Pretoria North. She would return to Harrod Moritz the next year and continue her school from grade 11. Now the question still stands. Exactly who was Annika Smith? And in my opinion, Annika Smith was a normal Pretoria North teenager. According to later stories and testimonies, Annika had started drinking by the age of 14. She had been a smoker, and there are claims that she had been sexually active by the age of 17. However, nobody would testify that Annika ever acted with malicious intent. Her friends seemed to have loved her greatly. And the outcry when the news of her death broke seems to corroborate this. Annika was like any of us, a normal person that had just wanted to be happy. She absolutely loved animals, and if you looked at her Facebook profile, you would still be able to find some pictures of her with animals, and the largest smile on her face. Annika was a natural blonde, but would on occasion color her hair. This just shows me more of the fearlessness that Annika had to express herself. I read in some articles where people spoke of Annika that she had never been scared to stand up for herself and speak her mind. This would be seen as rebellious behavior by some, and Annika would be dubbed a wild child at school and be part of a naughty group. But Annika was a good person that had simply wanted to live her life and be happy, even if it meant breaking a rule or two. You may be wondering why I'm being so blatantly honest about what many may see as flaws of Annika. It is not my intent to harm the memory of Annika, but instead to remember the actual Annika. Too many times we see that when a person passes away or is murdered, those close and even those not so close to the deceased person would always tell the world that this person was sweet that their smiles lit up the room, and that this was the best person they had ever known. And true as this may be about anyone, there has recently been several discussions of the so-called memories of a deceased person on various Facebook groups I'm in, and each and every person had said that they would like for their true personalities to be remembered, instead of their images being protected and their truths being hidden. So when I describe a victim in my case, I will always attempt to find the actual them, and tell you who this person really was, the good and the bad, as a show of respect, not just to the victims, but to the victims' loved ones. In 2010, Annika resumed her high school education. Now, for my international listeners, School terms in South Africa work a bit differently than in some other countries. Our school year starts in January and ends in December. We have four terms, each term lasting roughly three months, with normally a week to three week school holiday period between each term. By March of 2010, Annika had been living with her father for about six months. She was excited to return to visit her mother in the upcoming April holiday period that would have started roughly on the 24th of March 2010. Well, at least that would be the exact day Annika would fly down to visit her mother that now resided in the coastal city of Hartenbos in the West Cape, approximately 80 kilometers away from Oetzweren. Exactly two weeks before Annika would leave for her holiday, her mother had a sudden urge to phone Annika. At 9am on a Wednesday, while Annika was supposed to be at school, her mother picked up the phone and called her. She was very pleasantly surprised when Annika answered, and mother and daughter had a wonderfully excited conversation. Charlotte would hear that Annika's home with an ear infection, which is why she answered the phone. 
the two women discussed their plans for the holidays and caught up a bit before finally, right before hanging up, Annika would ask her mom to please make her an extra large jar of pickled beetroots. And so Charlotte did. Later that afternoon, Charlotte's husband would come home and ask her to sit down. He had received a call from Charlotte's ex-husband. Annika's father, Johann Smith, had come home to find his daughter on her bedroom floor. Annika had been brutally murdered. And so begins a mother's nightmare, but after 12 years is still not resolved. By the next day, the entire South Africa would find out. Annika Smith had been murdered, raped with a bottle, and her hands had been cut off. Now this is normally where I would tell you who the culprit was, how they had committed the murder, and why. Unfortunately, we do not have this information yet. I can however tell you more or less what we assume had happened to Annika. After Annika had spoken to her mother, she had sprawled out on the couch and continued with schoolwork. Sometime later, she received a visitor. She locked her father's two burbul dogs in the back of the property. The dogs were known to be aggressive towards people they did not know very well. But, it seems whoever the visitor was, Annika did know. She removed the locks from the gates and allowed the person in. She made them each a cup of coffee, but before they managed to take a sip of their coffee, the visitor attacked Annika. Her bike helmet was knocked over. The dining table knocked the skew, and a chair knocked over. The attack continued into Annika's bedroom, where eventually the visitor overpowered Annika, then stabbed her six times in the chest and neck, before using a bottle to rape her, and finally cutting off her hands before leaving the house. The investigation into the murder of Annika Smith was started. Warrant Officer Anneri Robinson would initially spearhead the investigation. Not long after the murder, a Pretoria North businessman would donate 20,000 rand to be used as a reward for anyone that has information on the murder of Annika Smith. By April, Pitt Smith, Annika's uncle, would add another 30,000 rand to this amount, making a total of 50,000 rand reward. On the 17th of May 2010, Nico Fenter, Annika's then 20 year old ex boyfriend, would be arrested on suspicion of murder. But on the 14th of September, the charges against him would be withdrawn. We will learn more about Nico Fenter on the next episode. Exactly one year after Annika's murder, more than 100 people had been questioned. By the 31st of October 2012, Annika's loved ones would finally place her ashes in the memorial wall of the Dutch Reformed Church in Florana. After Warrant Officer Robinson eventually left the case, famous super sleuth Piet Bailefeld would be named investigating officer, but he would only be on the case for three weeks before retiring, after which Lieutenant Colonel Mike van Aert took over the investigation. Mike van Aert at the time did not hold the rank of lieutenant colonel, but since this case involves a multitude of people, I will reference him at his current rank of lieutenant colonel for simplicity's sake. Colonel van Aert is still the lead investigating officer, but on the 14th of February 2013, he would be assigned to another case that would require his more immediate attention. This was the case of Riva Steenkamp who had been shot by her boyfriend, Oscar Pistorius. It seems that due to the public interest into the Riva Steenkamp case, the investigation into Annika Smith's murder was placed on the back burner and would eventually run dry. In 2014, Magistrate Pierre Vessels would order a judicial inquest into the murder of Annika Smith. Now, let's understand exactly what a judicial inquest is. The most simplest way to explain it is that it is a fact-finding mission. The court will hear testimonies and statements from many witnesses, experts, 
investigating officers are more in an attempt to paint a picture on what happened around the crime but does not have enough evidence to tell the story itself. As for courtiers from the witnesses and experts, it can add people to their list of persons of interest. A person of interest is not a suspect nor an accused, only a person on whom the court wishes to focus more. This could help to either incriminate them or exonerate them. But, and I cannot stress this enough, being a person of interest in a judicial inquiry does not make you an accused or suspect. The court will hear the inquiry and upon its completion decide whether there is enough evidence to actually accuse someone. If there is, then the state will open a case against the person or persons it deems responsible for the crime at which time a proper trial will be held and the court will be expected to prove their accusations. However, there is also the very strong possibility that the court may find that there is not enough evidence to charge any person. So what happens in a case like that? Well, to understand that, we have to give a very quick look at another case that recently found closure. In 2005, Rochelle Naidu was severely beaten before suffering a single fatal gunshot wound. Her boyfriend Faisal Hendricks claimed that Rochelle had committed suicide. Her family, however, did not believe this. One of the biggest clues that this was a lie was the fact that her jaw had been broken, so it was unlikely that she would have placed the gun in her own mouth. The pain itself would have been unbearable, Then there is also the issue of her jaw itself. She had been beaten so severely that her jaw had been broken. This only attests to the violence and anger aimed at her. Faisal Hendricks was arrested but freed again in 2006. A judicial inquiry would be held just like the one Pierre Vessels ordered and in this case the court delivered an undecided verdict and the state refused to attempt prosecution. Rochelle's family would not leave it there and in a historic move for South Africa, her family would privately prosecute Faisal Hendricks. This meant that instead of the state bringing charges against a person, the victim's next of kin would bring the charges and act in the stead of the state. They would have to bring the charges and prove guilt themselves, and the expenses of such a trial would be the responsibility of the family. Nonetheless, Rochelle's family had managed to go ahead. They had brought Faisal Hendricks to trial, and for the first time in South African history, a private prosecution on the charges of murder was successful. In 2014, Faisal Hendricks was found guilty and handed a 15-year sentence. He would continue to appeal these charges, and every time, the family of Rishal Naidu would have to fight the appeal, as the state normally would. But, on the 12th of January, 2022, the court heard the last appeal from Faisal Hendricks. He has now exhausted all avenues, and has no other choice than to serve his sentence. So how does this relate to Annika Smith? Well, plain and simple, if a judicial inquiry does not find enough evidence to charge anyone, her family does have another option. Granted, it is an expensive long shot, but there is also many aspects of a private prosecution that I am not at all familiar of. In fact, until January this year, I had been unaware this was even possible. But Nicole Engelbrecht from True Crime South Africa has indicated that she will be looking into this a bit more for a future episode. When she does release an episode, I will share a link to it on my Facebook page and we could all learn a bit more about this. But now, back to Annika. Magistrate Pierre Vessels had announced an inquiry to be held. The inquiry would have three people of interest at its start. The first, acting on behalf of the victim's interests, 
would be Annika's mother, Charlotte Eckstein. The other two would be Johann Smit, Annika's father, and Nico Fainter, Annika's ex-boyfriend. The state would set forth a total of 96 witnesses to testify during the inquiry. Chosen after going through 140 statements taken by the police. And although the inquiry was ordered in 2014 already, it would only start in September of 2015 after having given the state and all people of interest enough time to prepare. When the judicial inquest began, the involved parties were all taken to the Smith home and shown the crime scene. After this, the group returned to the courtroom, where magistrate vessels added a few points of interest to the record. These were, that in the Smith home, a blood stain was found on the carpet of the dining room. A cloth was placed over this stain. This cloth was never retrieved as evidence. On the photos of the crime scene, there was a pillow near Annika's body that was never taken into evidence. A part of her leg had rested on a silver makeup case, which was also never taken into evidence. On one of the crime scene photos, a green bag can be seen with a hair on it. None of this was taken into evidence. Annika's computer, cell phone and leather jacket was left in her room, completely untouched. There was an ashtray with cigarette buds in it. This was not taken into evidence. In the dustbin in Annika's bedroom, there was leftovers from a McDonald's meal that was not collected for evidence. There was a palm print belonging to Johann Smith found further in the house, and a smaller palm print, seemingly belonging to a woman, was also found in the house, but it could not be compared to Annika. And with that, the judicial inquiry would kick off. One of the first witnesses to testify was Damien Treby. Damien Treby had snuck away from school on the day of Annika's murder and was later found to have scratch marks on his body, and he was subsequently questioned regarding this. Damien Treby had been the topic of conversation, not only because he had been questioned regarding his absence and the scratch marks on his body, but because of rumours that he had been involved in Satanism and the occult. While testifying, Treby told the court that he had first encountered Satanism, while he was in primary school, when his father had kicked his brother out of the house for being involved in Satanism. Treby had then gone to the library to research Satanism. Eventually, when he had attended Pretoria North High School, he had been bullied a lot, and eventually he started to fight back. After he started fighting back to his bullies, he was approached by a group of Satanists within the school. And eventually, he became part of a group. He was protected by them, and the bullying stopped. Treby would fail his grade 10 year, and be moved from Pretoria North High School to Harrod Maritz High School. But he claims he was still invited to parties by this group. He said he had only attended one of these parties. It was also at this party that he would drink blood. He told the court he did not remember much from the party, as he had been under the influence of alcohol as well, but that he had seen some couples cut each other and even draw blood using needles and syringes. He believed this is where the blood he drank was sourced from, but he was not entirely sure. Treby also said that he had left the group before completing any rituals. Personal opinion time here. I don't believe this group was an actual satanic group. I think this may have been nothing more than a bunch of kids with a fascination in satanism. But nevertheless, I do believe that Treby and some of the kids in this group believed they were in the real deal at the time. Treby was also asked regarding messages he had sent on the instant messaging app named Mixit. Now, Again, to those listening from outside South Africa, you may not know what Mixit is. 
Mixit was created in the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa back in 1997. It very quickly gained popularity in South Africa for the simple fact that it was cheaper to use than text messages. You could log on whenever you wanted to, and it would only cost you one cent. You would then be able to stay on for as long as you want to, and would only need to pay again when you reconnected. So especially for teenagers, it was an affordable way to connect with your friends. And what was even more amazing, you didn't need a very fancy phone. Any color screen phone that could connect to the internet was able to download and support Mixit. Mixit also had the great functionality of allowing you to create private chat groups for your contacts or to join public chat groups, which made it easy for you to introduce friends to each other and to meet completely random strange people on the internet. At a time when not all households in South Africa had access to the internet and before the times of apps like Tinder and Grindr, Okay, so why am I telling you all this? Well, it's simple. You can now understand the app a bit better and understand the interactions those involved in the case had through it. In a moment, we will cover messages Streeby was questioned about. But I also find it important to note here that there is a very unlikely theory that the visitor Annika had that day that had presumably murdered her. She had met through Mixit. There is no evidence to support this theory, but there is no evidence to disprove this theory either. And as far as I can gather, the police never put much weight into this theory, as it was only rumours spread by her teenagers at the time. As for Treby's messages, Treby's username on Mixit was Vampire, and there were messages found between Treby and another unknown user named Satan Eyes. And the messages, Treby was asking Satan Eyes for a ritual to get rid of someone. The messages read as follows. Vampire. Will you give me one ritual? I want to see a person dead. Do you have a ritual to kill? Satan Eyes. Okay. Go to the graveyard and get some dirt, a shoebox, and hair from that person. Place it onto a door and visualize what you want to happen to this person. Channel all your hatred into it. Then, place the doll in the box. Bury it with sand in the shoebox. Go to the cemetery and bury the box and cover it in sand. Vampire. Is that it? When questioned about these messages, Treby claimed that they had been sent in 2008 and that it had nothing to do with Annika, but rather that it was related to his girlfriend's brother-in-law that was alleged to be abusive. She had apparently asked him to get such a ritual in a moment of anger at the man. Treby's girlfriend would give a testimony to support this, saying that she had asked Treby for this but that she knew he would not be able to go through with it. Treby was also questioned about his relationship with Annika. Treby had said that they were only acquaintances and he had only ever been outside her house and that was only on one occasion. He admitted that she, like many others, did not like him but that he had never had problems with her. This then brings us to the scratch marks on Treeby. As you would remember, Annika's hands had been removed. The working theory is that the perpetrator had removed her hands because she had fought back and scratched her attacker, and that her attacker had wanted to be rid of her DNA that would now be found under her nails. This then obviously caused suspicion on Treeby and the scratches on his body. Treeby would say that the scratches was made by his sister. He said that she had wanted to go to her boyfriend after they had broken up during an argument. But, 
as she was emotionally in a state, he had stopped her, and that is when he had been scratched. And this had happened three days after Annika's murder. Trebi's mother and sister would also testify to this. However, there was a problem. The testimonies between Trebi, his mother and his sister would either com- would even not match at all or were word for word the same. There were key differences that still remained. His mother stated that the argument had happened outside the house and that Trebi had gotten a small scratch on his neck, while his sister testified that the argument had happened inside the house and he had gotten three scratches on his neck. This would lead the legal representatives for Nico Fenter, Johann Smith and Charlotte Eckstein to believe that Trebi and his family had discussed the story beforehand. The court would also hear that when police initially questioned Trebi in 2010, that also searched his room. In his room, they had found several bullets, a homemade knife and a scalpel, and what police had called a spell book. These were all confiscated from him and cast serious light on him as a sp- suspect at the time. There was also testimonies made that Trebi had owned snakes at the time and would dissect them and remove their heads. During my research, I found a comment made in 2020 by a man that claimed to have been a friend of Trebi at the time. In this comment, he explicitly stated that Trebi had owned ball pythons and that his snakes had all died suddenly after an illness. Trebi had then dissected them in an attempt to understand what the illness had done to their bodies. And then lastly, Trebi's DNA was matched to DNA found on Annika's body. The result was negative. Through all of these questions, statements, and several days of court proceedings, magistrate vessels had ordered especially Trebi's identity to be held in the strictest of confidence. However, after he started to testify in court, a woman revealed his identity on a Facebook group dedicated to Annika. In the post revealing his identity, she also claimed that he was the murderer. This had brought a temporary standstill to the case as the court had to first look into this issue and Damien Treby had to very quickly obtain legal representation. The woman would be charged with criminal injuria and disobeying an order from the court. But after mediation and a written apology to both Treby and the magistrate, the charges against her would eventually be dropped. The damage, however, was done. The world knew Trebi's name, and for a while, he would be found guilty by public opinion. Trebi would be added as a person of interest, which meant that more focus would be placed on him and his whereabouts on the day of 10 March 2010. Now, I really wanted to do Annika's case as a single episode. But time constraints has told me that would not be possible. So I've decided to cut part one off here. Join me again next week Friday as we further explore the judicial inquiry into what happened to Annika Smith. Thank you all for listening and stay safe, wicked listeners.